Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Peter Munoz. I'm a member of the class, the Cal class of 1968. Go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I would like to welcome all of you to today's program, uh, YouTube, blogs, texting, the web. Uh, how is new media uh, changing politics? Um, the program today is uh, co-sponsored by the class of 68's uh, Center for Civility and Democratic Engagement uh, and the Golden School of Public Policy. We are uh, privileged and honored to have as our uh, panelists Professor Henry Brady, Professor Bruce Kane, and Professor uh, Jeffrey Nunberg. Now, before we begin our discussion, I would like to say a few words about the Center for Civility and Democratic Engagement, uh, which was founded by the uh, Cal class of 1968 and is housed in the Golden School of Public Policy. Uh, there is a flyer that's being handed out that has uh, uh, the, the description of the panelists and also a description of the, the uh, center. Um, in brief, the center uh, is um, based upon the experiences of the class of 68. Uh, the class 68 has experienced uh, two eras which are marked by political and social polarization, the, both the 1960s and the present day. Uh, there's public dialogue, it often lacks civility uh, today, uh, and efforts at consensus building uh, are rare. The center, the center focuses on understanding conflict, fostering constructive dialogue, and encouraging greater democratic uh, participation. The flyer that is out there has the website, uh, and uh, you can read more about the center uh, and uh, become engaged uh, as much as you want to become engaged. Uh, now, I would like to introduce uh, today's panelists. Uh, I will not go through all of their honors, awards, and accomplishments. Uh, if I did that, I'd be here for about an hour. So therefore, we'd like to, uh, I'll give you more of a thumbnail sketch of the, uh, the various uh, panelists. Uh, first, let me begin with Professor Henry Brady. Uh, he is the class of 91 Monroe Deutsch Professor of Political Science and Public Policy at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he worked for the Federal Office of Management and Budget, uh, and uh, he has written on electoral politics, political participation, social welfare policy, political polling, uh, and statistical methodology. He is the president-elect of the American Political Science Association and the past president of its uh, Political Methodology Society. Um, he is uh, the incoming dean for the Goldman School of Public Policy, uh, and he is the co-director of the Center for Civility and Democratic Engagement. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Bruce Kane. He is the Heller Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Berkeley. He is the director of the University of California, Washington Center. Uh, he has authored and co-authored numerous books, uh, including Congressional Redistricting. Uh, he has served as a polling, polling consultant and redistricting consultant for the California legislature. Uh, and he is the political commentator for numerous radio and television stations. He is also the co-director for the Center on Civility and Democratic Engagement. Professor Jeffrey Nunberg is a professor of the University of California Berkeley School of Information, uh, he, where he teaches courses on history and the social implications of information technologies. Professor Nun Nunberg's most recent book, Talking Right, um, is published in, uh, on, by Public Affairs in 2006. He has a new book, The Years of Talking Dangerously, will appear uh, from Public Affairs in May of 2009, and he is currently working on a book about the paradoxes of civility in the American public discourse. So I'd like to turn it over now to Professor Brady. Thank you. Welcome. It's great to have you here uh, on a beautiful day. In fact, thank you for coming indoors because it's so wonderful outside. I want to talk a little bit about the internet and how it's changed, or maybe not changed, political participation. Uh, this is some research I've done with some collaborators at Harvard and Boston College. And the basic question is, has the internet affected the stratification of politics in America? We know that people who are better off in terms of education or income typically participate more in politics, and people who are less well off participate less. There's been some claims or some thoughts that the internet has changed everything. And in changing everything, that means that groups that previously were not mobilized to politics have a new method to get involved, and they do get involved. So has it leveled the playing field? And, and just to show you what I mean by that, there's this cartoon here uh, showing that 
Uh, there are some thought that it could completely level the, the playing field. Uh, you don't know who the person is or the entity is at the other end of the internet when you're on a blog or something like that, and it could be, in fact, a dog. Um, so has it made it possible for new people to enter the political arena? So there's a lot of claims to this effect. So to answer these claims, my co-authors and I went and did a survey with the Pew Center uh, uh, on the Internet and American Life, uh, where we designed some questions uh, before the election in September 2008, and we got a random sample of the American public, and that's where these data come from. What we did first is we sort of said, let's split up these 2,200 respondents into five categories, which gives us five levels of socioeconomic status, which is a big social science term, meaning the people who are better off and the people who are less well off. And we used characteristics like education and family income. And to give you an idea of what that looks like in America, here's the quintiles, the five categories we broke people up into. And you might want to look at that and figure out where you are, which quintile you're in. Uh, people are often surprised by this, and they find out they're in a higher quintile than they think they are. Most survey questions where we ask people, what class are you in, they say middle class. Um, and it turns out that many of them are not middle class, they're upper class, and some of them are not really middle class, they're, they're lower down. So this will give you some idea of what the five quintiles look like in our data. And I'm going to use these five quintiles repeatedly. And so the idea is that right now, a lot of people in the top fifth, for example, participate in politics, but as you go down the ladder, fewer and fewer, fewer people participate. Okay, so let's take five traditional political acts, and then I've got the percentage in our sample who did these things, things like writing a letter to an official, uh, contacting a public official, signing a political petition, things like that, giving money to politics. So we take these five acts and we ask, what is the percent doing these traditional non-web political acts by socioeconomic level? So this is the percent doing at least one of these things. So some of them did two, some did three, some did four, some did five. And what you see immediately is if you put along the horizontal axis these five quintiles, going from the lowest to the highest, that the percentage doing these acts goes up as you get to higher quintiles. Not a big surprise something we've known for a long, long time. So in fact, 35% of the people in the first quintile uh, do one or more of these acts, and 75% in the fifth quintile, in the top quintile. Politics is stratified in America. Not a big surprise. Well, what's true with respect to the internet? Well, the first thing to understand about the internet is that in fact, it's stratified too. And that if you look at various categories of whether you're on the internet, whether you have high speed access, whether you have slow connection, it looks like this with in fact tremendous stratification as well, going from about 44% in the first quintile to 99% in the fifth quintile, being on the internet in some fashion. That's by socioeconomic status. It's just fun to show you this one too, which is by age. Uh, <laughs> Big age along the bottom, older people, folks like me towards the right. And uh, guess what? It's the young people who are on the internet. It's not the old folks. Another thing that maybe isn't so surprising given what we know. Okay. Now, the notion is that maybe the web has changed everything. So let's take social networking sites. And hopefully I'll get the names of the sites right. In one lecture I gave, I ended up with MySpace being my face and Facebook being Spacebook, I think, something like that. But you get the idea. These are social networking sites which the younger people, if, if the older people want to turn to the younger people in the audience and ask what I'm talking about, that's perfectly okay. <laughs> and they can tell you. So these are people using social networking sites, and what you find out here is it's amazingly unstratified compared to what I showed you a moment ago. Social networking sites are much more egalitarian, and in fact, the other thing to know about them is the age stratification. It's young people using social networking sites quite dramatically. So two things. Social networking at sites, at least, seem to have flattened, leveled the playing field with respect to socioeconomic status, but it is the young doing those things. You might think, well, actually, if we controlled for age, it would turn out there'd be more stratification, more socioeconomic stratification, but that's not true. Here we take the percent of 
their 18 to 30 year olds, younger, younger people, using social networking sites by SES levels, and it's still not very stratified. So even for those people who are really using the sites, the young people, it's not much socially stratified. So that suggests the internet has changed everything. But has it changed everything with respect to political participation? In our survey, we asked about five web-based political acts, which were designed to roughly parallel the five earlier ones I showed you. So these are things you could do on the web that looked like things that you used to be able to do by letter or telephone or mechanisms like that. And so here's those five acts. And let's look and compare political participation on the web versus political participation off the web. Well, first of all, let's just look at political participation on the web and compare it with social networking sites. So the blue line is web political acts, and the red line is social networking. And the first thing we notice, obviously, is where social networking was pretty flat, the web-based political acts are not flat at all. They're highly socioeconomically stratified. Somehow, although it looks like the web has flattened the playing field with respect to social networking sites, it has not done so with respect to web-based political acts of the sorts I just showed you. So it doesn't look like maybe the web has changed everything. It hasn't maybe changed political participation on the web because it, political participation on the web looks a lot like political participation off the web. Let me skip that one. Uh, and let's skip that one, too. Um, I'm trying to get through this. So uh, here's all three of the lines I've really shown you so far. Social networking, web-based political acts, and off-web political acts. And what you notice is that the socioeconomic stratification of web-based political acts is even greater than the socioeconomic stratification of off-web political acts. So if anything, the web has increased the stratification, the degree to which there's a disparity between those at the top of the income and educational pyramid and those at the bottom of the educational and income pyramid with respect to political participation. It's more stratified on the web, not less stratified. You might say, well, that's just because in the previous slide I showed you people, everybody, and some of those people aren't online. And if I just looked at the people online, so I'm just taking the subset of people who have access to the internet, and I'm going to see if we still find substantial stratification with respect to web-based political acts versus off-web political acts, and the answer is yes. For those online, there's still substantial stratification. So it's not just the fact that some people aren't online yet, and those people tend to be lower socioeconomic status. It's that somehow we have reproduced on the web, even among those online, the same socioeconomic disparities that we have with regular, standard, typical political acts. The web has not changed everything. So the web has not overcome the stratification of American politics. I could show you other data that shows the same result holds for money, giving money. There's some notion of, oh, no, no, where the web's really had an impact is it's really gotten a lot of small political donations from not so well-off people. And the answer is no, that's not what it's done. It has done this, by the way. It looks like it may have activated some younger people to get involved in politics. These tend to be younger people who are better off, by the way but it has gotten them more involved in politics. So it has reduced what we used to see, which was it used to be middle-aged and older people who gave a lot of money to politics and not so much young people. Young people in 2008 were somewhat more activated to give money to politics by the web, it looks like. Now, the one area which I've already shown you, I'm gonna go back a slide, where there seems to be some flatness with respect to the web, and indeed, notice here when we just look at people online, Social networking actually is what we call anti-stratificational. The people here in the top fifth actually use social networking less than people in the bottom fifth. It looks like if you look at political acts, in fact, that are social network mediated, that is to say, people who did political acts using social networking sites, those actually look like they're more leveled. So what does that lead us to? Well, my final conclusion is this. It's that 
usually when you get new technologies like the web, the first thing that happens is people try to do things they used to do by other means on the new technology. And if you look at those kinds of political acts, so you used to use a telephone to recruit somebody, now you use an email message, those kinds of things. You used to give money by mail, now you give money over the web. Those kinds of things, by and large, look like they used to look. But the web has also had a revolutionary change in social networking technology. We've never had a social networking technology like the web before. And there it looks like maybe there's a bit of a change and a little more leveling of the playing field. But the problem is this. Social networking sites are still in their infancy. We don't know if they're going to grow up to ultimately level the playing field or they're going to grow up to just look like all of these other kinds of web-based political acts. So the story is still not clear. Has it changed everything? No. Has it maybe changed some things? Yes, perhaps, especially with respect to the newer modes of web-based activity like social networks, and maybe blogs, by the way, look like they're a little bit more counter-stratificational. And the net result is maybe the web is making a difference, but we don't know for sure yet. Thanks. I think it is now. Oh, now you got yeah. it. It had to warm up. Um, <clears throat> right after the election, there were people inside the Obama camp, people I know, some of them Cal grads, who were pushing very hard for Obama to take the internet-based organization that he had that worked so successfully in his campaign and turn it into a tool for governance. And in particular, there were people who thought that the legion of young volunteers that were tied in through the web uh, and who were giving small amounts of money or who were organizing through the web, that they could be mobilized for political purposes to help Obama in uh, pushing various programs. And the best example of this was uh, their recent experiment to try to, to mobilize these people for uh, support for the stimulus package. And the result of that mobilization was a dismal failure. That is to say, uh, there were volunteers sent out to try to get people to sign petitions in favor of the stimulus package, but they didn't get many signatures and it didn't get much attention and it certainly didn't buy them any support. Which is a reminder that just because you have the means of political mobilization doesn't mean you have the motivation for political mobil mobilization. And trying to mobilize around something which is, shall we say, a little more esoteric than the presidential election, that is, the, the, the features of a very complicated stimulus bill um, or a budget, uh, are, um, are just not providing enough mobilization. And I'm not sure that that's altogether a bad thing, because I'm, I think using the Internet for the purposes of rallying people to the cause of a particular policy uh, is probably not a sustainable kind of exercise. But I think the more valuable things for uh, internet with respect to governance have to do with transparency. And uh, when we talk about transparency and the internet, we, what we're talking about is that the internet makes transparency possible in two ways. One, it makes it easier for people to get documents and information about the government. And secondly, uh, it increases the volume that is available to citizens for governance. And we've seen three types of uh, uses of transparency or phases of transparency that the Obama people and previous administrations um, have experimented with. The first one is what you would call pre-decisional 
transparency. And the best example of that is Obama, during the transition period, put documents that were sent by interest groups that were petitioning for particular policy positions, those were posted on a website. And you could go and you could look and see what the teachers and what the uh, uh, various nonprofits were advocating or even businesses were advocating for policy in given areas. And that's, uh, if you like, transparency about inputs. And I think um, it was a step forward. It's not something that had been done before. And it was, I think, successful. The second kind of transparency is transparency of process. And we have that in California with the Brown Act um, and the Keen bagley Act at the state level. And the federal government has sunshine laws. But for most part, transparency about process is about observing the decision making of government and being able to witness the choices that are made. And that is a really tough area for any government because there are times when it's much easier to make decisions in private than it is to make it in public. And the best example of Obama's problem with that is the rather trivial, but nonetheless in Washington, it was a big deal, example of the second swearing in. You may recall that the first swearing in was flubbed, and so they had to redo the second swearing in, and to the annoyance of the press, it was not done in front of the press. Because the expectation of transparency had been you said you were going to be completely transparent. Why did you hide the swearing in? Why weren't we allowed to? Um, why, aren't we, why weren't we allowed to witness this? And so, transparency of process is uh, is a tricky area. They've already they're already in the press corps. Uh, people that are annoyed at the Obama administration about this. It sort of comes up with uh, the AIG um, bailout because we 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 only found after the fact where the money and the bailout was going. By that time, the decision had already been made. So if you objected to the fact that AIG was giving money to many of the same banks that were already getting bailout money, it was too late, right? It was after the fact. You couldn't object. So in-process transparency can make a big difference in terms of the, uh, the political ability to, s to either uh, facilitate or inhibit uh, a government decision. And finally, we have after-the-fact accountability, which is perhaps, from a political science point of view, the most important part of accountability, because that allows us to make judgments about, uh, retrospective judgments about an administration. And we've had a good example of that in the papers in the last couple of days, which is the release of the memos about the harsh inter interrogation slash torture techniques that were authorized by the previous administration. And this, of course, has now raised the whole question of whether or not the people who wrote those memos or who implemented those memos uh, should be held accountable in the court system. And, uh, and, and that perhaps is the most important part of transparency because uh, accountability, bringing consequences to governments that misbehave or uh, are uh, not competent, is uh, an essential part of what we think uh, a democratic government's all about. Now, I want to make four observations. I'm, about transparency in the internet that I think will correspond to some of the things that Henry said in his talk. First of all, more information is not always a good thing. More information is not always a good thing. A radical thing for an academic to say, but true. Think, for example, of Proposition 8. Many of us have pushed for the importance of campaign finance disclosure that it's very important to know who's giving money to whom. And there are laws now that require that when you give money, you have to list your occupation, you have to list how much money you gave, when you gave it, et cetera. Now, one of the objections when people were pushing for campaign disclosure is that when we vote, we vote anonymously. Why do we vote anonymously? We vote anonymously because we don't want coercion on our individual choice. A democracy would be subverted if we were being coerced into voting one way or another. But we don't extend that same logic to giving money. And what happened in Prop 8 is that people who gave money in favor of Prop 8 could be, you could find out the names of those individuals and people who objected to their political position could take, um, could, could hold them accountable for that by, uh, you know, violence, threats, et cetera. And indeed, when campaign disclosure 
laws were first discussed, it was many minor parties that said, you know, this is, this is a dangerous law because it uh, subjects me to uh, possible pressures and threats from my neighbors or from political opponents. So more information is not always a good thing. Uh, there are privacy considerations, there are security considerations. And so any freedom of information law that's designed by an, uh, an advanced democracy always has exceptions for privacy or security. The second thing is the amplification of mistakes. That is, if you're really going to put everything that's done in the stimulus bill out on the web, inevitably a few of these things are going to be ridiculous. They're going to be misspent. And that means that you're opening yourself up to the opposition. And you may have 80% of your projects that are perfectly valid, but some small number of them could be uh, open to ridicule. And that can be then used against you and against the stimulus package. And that then weakens you politically when makes it harder than to, to go to the next round of either a bailout or stimulus package. So it has political consequences as well. Um, so the first point is more information is not always a good thing. Second problem is if you build it, they will not necessarily come. And that's really uh, Henry's message, or one of Henry's messages. Uh, they will not necessarily come because of the digital divide, which, as Henry points out, is particularly still there with respect to political use of the, uh, of the uh, internet, as opposed to social uses of the internet, which is a corollary in my earlier principle about mobilization, which is the means and the motivation are separable things. And if you don't have the motivation to pay attention to politics, then the fact that you've made it easier or that you have websites that are uh, you know, chock-a-block with information and even sexy graphics, that won't matter if you're not interested in it. If you're more interested in the sex life of Britney, Britney Spears, you're going to go to Britney Spears. You're not going to go to the Obama website to find out what, where money's being spent. So motivation and means are completely different things. Uh, the other problem you have is uh, what is, is sometimes called in the literature the citizen slacker problem. That is to say, um, many citizens really are not plugged into politics at all. And so no matter how much you do to make this information available, they're just not going to take advantage of it. Uh, so that's an important thing to remember. The third thing to remember is the garbage in, garbage out. That is to say, the Internet will facilitate the speed and the volume of information, but if the information is terrible then we're worse off. And this is a real problem because of the demise of the print media and uh, the people, the role that the press has played historically in trying to provide data which is validated to us by some professional norms and standards. And what we have instead are information channels which are increasingly siloed by ideology or by taste. And uh, we have a decline in common information that we used to share as a result of uh, you know, the three networks that we all watched and we had common information and there were norms through the journalism school of how you would produce that information. That's now being replaced by a brave new world, some of which is good and some of which is bad. Um, people that take it upon themselves to be uh, reporters of information sometimes do not live up to the standards that you would hope. So that leads my, to my last point that I'll finish on, which is the internet is killing the print media and what's going to take its place. Um, the story is just all too common. You can read about it almost every day. You see it in this area. The San Francisco Chronicle is hurting. The San Francisco Chronicle may not be here in a year or two. And it's not just the Chronicle, it's the Times. It's the Post. All of the newspapers are suffering badly and they may not survive. And they may not survive because of the free content over the internet. Their websites are doing well. The Chronicle's website, I think, is number five in terms of its number of hits. Uh, the Washington Post website is doing very well. But the problem with those websites is that they're not generating any revenue to sustain the kind of reporting that you see in the print media. So it's not an economically viable model, even though it's a model that gets a lot of hits. The Craigslist problem, that is, the Craigslist has taken away a lot of the advertising revenue. And most importantly, most importantly, if I took a vote, and I won't embarrass people here, of how many people get paper in print form versus those that don't, 
Henry's charts, generational charts, would be even more dramatic than the ones he had right here. The people in my building at UC Washington Center, they don't subscribe. You don't see newspapers out the front. 280 students, there's not one newspaper that's dropped off at my center. Why? Are they stupid? Are they not reading? No, of course not. They're going to the internet and they're getting their information from uh, the aggregators, the Yahoo, the Google News. They're going to specialized sites, real clear politics, etc. Good sites. But those sites are parasites that are taking content from the print media, and that's not a sustainable economic model. Well, where is this all going to go? Well, we don't know. There are various models that are out there. One is the possibility of the knowledge-based aggregators, the Yahoo's and the Google's, still having enough ad revenue so that they can perhaps pay for reporters to go out and do the work that was previously done by the elite uh, newspapers. Um, Huffington Post, perhaps, is the closest thing to that. Uh, a second possibility is that maybe at least some of this information will come through some kind of Wikipedia-like effort of bloggers, but that would make a lot of us very nervous if that's the real source of impartial information. The third possibility, and one that I think we're seeing some evidence of, and I want to put it in as a plug because it's something we're doing at our center, is the nonprofit model of uh, reporting. We've started a program called the UC Journalism Program at the center. We've hired uh, the a previous Washington bureau chief from the San Francisco Chronicle, Mark Sandalo, and we're going to recruit students throughout the whole system to come spend a semester and report on Washington-based stories and, uh, and then give them out or s uh, distribute them to uh, smaller media in, uh, in D.C., uh, in, in California. Um, but whether a proliferation of such nonprofit uh, centers is uh, or... or uh, even to have the universities more involved in the generation of news, one suspects that's not going to be big enough to fill the void. So the internet, in short, uh, facilitates transparency, but there are some real limitations in terms of how far you can go with this, and it is killing the printed media, and we're not sure what's going to replace it. Thank you. Uh, let me start. I'm Jeff Nunberg. Let, let, let me just, we got, we got sound? Good. Um, let me just start by, um, with, a, with a, a brief promotional plug for the uh, logo you see on the upper left corner of the screen. Uh, I'm uh, at the uh, Berkeley uh, School of Information. We're either the newest or one of the newest faculties on, on campus. We're in the oldest building on campus, South Hall, that gothic Adams family looking structure facing the, uh, the Campanile. And we have... Uh, um, people ranging from political scientists to psychologists to anthropologists uh, to, uh, to historians to uh, computer scientists who are looking at uh, technologies in their social, economic, uh, and, uh, and political um, context. Um, <coughs> uh, we're chiefly a, a, a graduate faculty, but we do have undergraduate uh, classes. Uh, uh, Paul Duguid and I have been teaching a course uh, in the history of information from cave painting uh, to YouTube, or, or as I call it, moving right along, is the way it's uh, I'm, I'm a linguist by, by training, and uh, I want to say a, a, a few words on uh, the, the way in which um, the new media in general and the web in particular have influenced uh, the language of politics. <coughs> Excuse me. There's, um, there's an idea, a very common idea, whenever a new technology emerges, that it has this profound effect on the language, direct and I immediate effect on the language. Um, back in, uh, in uh, that should be 1848, um, uh, a gentleman named Conrad Swackheimer, Swackheimer uh, wrote an article called The Influence of the Telegraph Upon Literature. The telegraph was already being touted as something that would change fundamentally the nature of commerce and war and politics. It would bring nations together, eliminate national boundaries, eliminate distance and, and time. And in the course of things, Swackheimer said, it would also profoundly change the English language and bring it to uh, a new standard of perfection, as he put it, by, uh, by creating a language that would be terse, condensed, expressive, sparing of expletives, that's extra words, and utterly ignorant of synonyms. Um, well, 
The English language did, did simplify the written language,、um, but it, it took quite a while. And if you look、uh, 40 or 50 years after Swackheimer wrote this,、uh, you were looking at writers like Henry James, about whom whatever else you can say, you would not describe as terse, condensed, <laughs> sparing of expletives, or, or ignorant of, 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 of synonyms. But this view continues. This,、uh, this view I, I, think I, I like to think of now as Swackheimerism.、Um, Uh, not long ago, James Billington,、uh, the Librarian of Congress,、uh, speaking of、uh, IM and texting,、um, and I suppose tweeting, although I don't know if he knew about tweeting,、uh, are bringing about the slow destruction of the basic unit of human thought, the sentence. Now, I don't know what the future of the English sentence is, but I'm going to assume that、uh, it's not going to change profoundly because kids are now sending each other、uh, instant messages rather than passing notes under the desk. In, in algebra class. And I think the general moral of this <coughs> is that communication technology can amplify, accelerate, focus、uh, ongoing changes,、um, but it rarely single handedly initiates uh, uh, new ones. And I think if you look at、um, the, um, some of the, per、uh, the, the perceived、uh, changes that are going on with regard to the language of, of the web, in particular political language, Um, they mostly continue processes that have been going on for、uh, a, a long time. The broadening of access、uh, to the media, not necessarily in the number of people who are involved, but the,、um, <coughs> the, the possibility of participation,、um, the convergence of registers. That's a linguist's way of, of, of talking about the, 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 the way in which the discourse is becoming more colloquial and informal.、Uh, the convergence of public and private context, of author and audience, where Uh, the difference between being an author and being a reader、uh, is being conflated as, as everyone is in a position to do, to do both.、Um, and uh, finally, two uh, properties that have been、uh, asserted of political language may be a little more uh, uh, controversial the increasing polarization of political language, and something I almost certainly won't get to the, the rise of incivility and snarkiness and, and general ill temper、uh, in, in internet discourse.、Um, People have been talking for a long time about the widening of,、uh, of access to communication.、Uh, Carlyle was saying it in the 1840s.、Uh, the German critic、uh, Walter Benjamin was saying it in the 1930s.、Um, it's, it's been said for a long time. And it's certain that the internet、uh, enables more active participation in, in political discourse. And by active participation, I mean you cannot simply read, but you can write and exchange and put comments on blogs、uh, and so forth. Whether or not, Um, uh, a larger number of people are taking advantage of that possibility, and Henry was indicating that the, the data aren't in on that.、Um, <coughs> it also、uh, continues this process of what I call spanning the distance between public and private language. Back in 1927, the, the great American philosopher John Dewey、um, wrote that public opinion arises. When the things we read, the things we see, as, as Dewey was, was thinking about it, are chewed over in the context of our private exchanges with our friends. And it's only a conversation, he said, has a vital import lacking in the fixed and frozen words of written speech. That and only that gives reality to public opinion. You have to understand when Dewey was, was writing this,、um, it wasn't simply the case that, that writing and, and, and speech were, were far apart, but the languages used at these two levels were, were quite different.、Um, <coughs> the history of the 20th century, linguistically, in a certain sense, is a history of the progressive colloquialization of, 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 of、uh, the English language becoming more informal and so on. The average sentence length in William Jennings Bryan's Cross of Gold speech, the famous speech that won him、uh, as a boy orator the, the Democratic nomination in 1896, was 104 words. In George Bush's 2004 convention speech, 15. Now, let me just say, I, I did that number because I, I did. This a little while ago. Had I looked at Obama's speech, what I haven't done, it would not be that different. It might be 16 or 17 words. It's not going to be 25, much less,、uh, much less 100. This is a very general tendency. If you look at the average sentence length in newspapers, the New York Times,、uh, 1916, it was about 38 words.、Uh, 1936, around the same. By 1956, it had dropped to 21. It's actually gone up a bit since then, but it's still much lower. And if you look at the punctuation, the density of punctuation, it, it Follows the same pattern. Same pattern if you look at bestsellers. Same pattern if you look at scientific journals like Science. Not quite as so marked, but the average sentence length, number of punctuation marks is going down. English style is getting simpler and more informal.、Um, <coughs> some of this happened、um, naturally because of the growth of broadcasting.、Um, 
I won't play these clips because we're, we're, we're moving right along here, but um, the advent of radio certainly made a difference. The upper left father, Charles Coughlin, a kind of crypto-fascist, semi-fascist uh, figure of the 1930s, built an enormous radio audience uh, and was a very powerful figure in American politics for, for several years. Um, but when you listen to Coughlin's speeches, they're delivered in a formal, ornate, elaborate, oratorical style. It's very far from what you, what you hear today on, 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 on talk radio. Um, <coughs> uh, at the same time, you begin to see growing out of this um, the emergence of new informal genres of political communication. But many people would date this with uh, uh, Roosevelt's, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's initiation of his fireside chats, his radio chats. Though again, listening to them, they're quite formal by the standards of uh, informal political communication. Now, um, <coughs> we've reached the point, initially through talk radio and now through the internet, where, where there's not that much difference between the language used um, by politicians and journalists and the language that ordinary people use in discussing these things. It makes it possible, among other things, for language to percolate up and, and, and drip down. That is to say, it's much easier for someone to introduce a new term and work its way, have it work its way into ordinary discourse if it comes on, say, through Rush Limbaugh, where you're hearing it in a conversational context, or for language to percolate up from the internet uh, into the language of talk shows and, 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 uh, and political language. The discourse is also becoming more polarized. Um, this mirrors um, a well-known phenomenon, the polarization of political views among the political elite or the politically engaged or political activists. The idea that the country itself is becoming more polarized is a controversial one. There's a lot of work in political science and, and sociology to suggest that's not true. But certainly the people who are most active in the blogs and um, in political context on the internet are uh, more polarized, and it shows in their language. Um, <coughs> and it, this is a, a remarkable uh, a figure, um, uh, two former colleagues of mine uh, uh, did this. This shows the polarization of blogs. Um, the, the, blo the red lines indicate links between conservative blogs. The blue lines between liberal blogs, and the yellow lines, the few connections between conservatives and liberal blo uh, bl blogs. And as you can see, uh, mostly these people link to one another, they cite the same uh, uh, sources, they cite different news stories. The conservatives, if you look at the, the stories that the conservatives cite, they tend to be very different from, from the liberals. These are two, in discourse terms, two separate universes. Um, and the language reflects that. Um, some of the things you would not be surprised to see, uh, there are these policy-related terms. One side talks about undocumented uh, workers, another side talks about illegal aliens. Uh, one side talks about uh, the estate tax, the other side about the death tax. One side talks in connection with Social Security about personal accounts, the other side about private accounts. This is familiar territory. It's already well established in journalism and so forth. There's also um, <coughs> familiar but, but interesting differences in the way certain key terms that it, it, it denote key contested concepts are, are dealt with, like, like the word elite. Um, if you look at... Um, uh, liberal sites, you find that the phrase corporate elite greatly outnumbers uh, in, in frequency the phrase liberal uh, 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 media elite. Uh, on the other side, on conservative sites, uh, the phrase corporate elite almost doesn't appear. The elite are people in media and the academy, like the three of us uh, who are <laughs> here as representatives of, 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 of the group. <coughs> What's perhaps even more interesting from a linguist point of view is that um, one sees stylistic and almost tonal differences in the language that don't seem to be connected either to specific views on policy or to these underlying ideological differences that we use to characterize the left and, and right in America. Just consider the political epithets that each side uses. Um, someone on the other side, are they, are they wing nuts or are they moon bats? Well, if you're, if you're on the, da the Daily Coast, which is a, a, a liberal site, uh, the people on the other side are almost always going to be wing nuts with just a, 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 a small helping of, of moon bats. Um, if you're contributing to Free Republic on the other side, moon bats, um, but not wing nuts. With the implication that the two sides don't see each other asymmetrically, or they see, they see the excesses of the other side in very different terms. The, each, each of these crystallizes a very different stereotype of what the crazies on the other side are like. Um, <coughs> even more interesting, certain constructional differences 
Um, the phrase, you liberals, uh, appears far more often in Google groups than the phrase, you conservatives. Um, but if you look at the phrase, we liberals and we conservatives, they're pretty much the same. And in fact, the evidence suggests that there are about the same numbers of liberals and conservatives talking on these groups, just that the conservatives tend to address the liberals using that, 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 that form, you. And let me, let me just say one thing by the by. The wonderful thing for linguists is that this informal language, um, for the first time, is available to us to look at and actually quantify and study in, 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 in these ways. Um, similarly, I, I won't talk about that exactly. Similarly, even more curious to linguists, the, 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 the construction that classical rhetoricians call polysyndeton, a word you can go home and try, try out, um, which is the repeated um, uh, use of conjunctions, uh, baseball and football and soccer and hockey, instead of using commas, using these, the and or or there, is far more common among conservative writers than among liberal writers. Uh, so you phrases like love and commitment and sacrifice and a willingness to share responsibility and not walking away with one's children and so on, that's a very common phrase, a, a construction on the, among conservative writers. It's relatively rare among liberal writers, though, though there, there are exceptions. And I'd, I'd tie this to uh, uh, a, a difference in um, uh, the, the way in which certain populist rhetoric has been adopted by, by both sides. Um, finally, let me, let me make a point um, about <coughs> the uh, polarization uh, and, and the way it affects certain languages. Uh, linguists have a term, hearth languages, which are the languages, when a language is dying, before it disappears, it's still spoken by old women around the fireside. This is what you see in, in Asia or American Indian languages. That, 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 that's why linguists call them hearth languages. Um, and there seems to be on the internet, I don't have quantitative evidence to support this, a growth in these hearth languages. You'll find a word like socialistic. Uh, socialistic was a, was a big word in American politics in the 1930s and 40s and through the 50s. And then it more or less fell off a cliff. Uh, it, it just ceased to be used. Uh, and, and, more or less disappeared from common political discourse. Uh, speakers at Republican conventions no longer use socialistic to characterize uh, the democratic programs and so forth. It remains alive um, on the websites and blogs of the left and in fact, and the right, and in fact has been increasing in frequency. On the other side, uh, the word reactionary almost parallels exactly in frequency the word uh, socialistic. It was a time when in the Roosevelt years, uh, speakers at, at Democratic conventions would denounce the Republicans' reactionaries. That doesn't happen anymore, but the word is alive on Daily Coast, and so on. And what you see, in a certain sense, as these two discourses separate, is the continuation of these hearth languages, which are only spoken uh, by, by, by people on, on, on the same side. Um, let, me, let me stop with that, because we do want to move on to the, this, the discussion. Uh, thanks. <coughs> <coughs> and happy to do so. Please stand up. I think we have some microphones that can come to you. So raise your hand and get a microphone. Please, yes sir. Are you saying then that standard English as we used to learn in school, well those older of us who learned in school then is, is dead now and it's all going to be colloquial English? Well, I, I, don't know, I don't know that standard English and colloquial English are, 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 are different things. Standard colloquial English is the, the English we speak informally among, among ourselves. I think the, the written standard um, is at a less, less of a remove from the spoken language than it was in the time of Henry James, but that doesn't mean that our writers are lesser writers, our poets are lesser poets, or our op-ed writers are lesser op-ed columnists. I was wondering how you categorize blogs, websites, or authors as either conservative or liberal. The, the, um, it, it, it the, the, the research by um, uh, uh, Adamick and uh, uh, Glantz that I, that I showed there, they did a fairly sophisticated link analysis and, and used the most popular blogs and, and link analysis. You can just look at blog. You can just say, well, Daily Coast is a liberal blog and uh, uh, Michelle Malkin's a conservative blog and then look at sets of blogs like that, and, and the regularities are pretty general across those, those lines. I'm wondering about the, uh, the drive to produce information. For example, I buy a newspaper uh, in order to get what I hope is uh, objective, full information. Uh, and so the newspapers presumably pay some attention to that. They 
try to give you information uh, of an objective type, because that's what I buy. On the other hand, uh, who pays for what's on the internet? If they pay for it, uh, you know, what's the drive to do, some, do something that's really right? Well, I mean, that's the question. And, um, you know, the, in the past, as I said, the model was that uh, the newspapers through advertising uh, revenue and from the sales of the papers and subscriptions could pay to have professional journalists who were trained in the norms of reporting with verification of sources and uh, some attempt at least to report the facts as neutrally as possible. Now, one of the problems uh, is that the newspapers, I think, undid, uh, th they were responsible partly for their own demise. Uh, in the sense, in two senses. One, journalism became very lazy in the 80s and 90s. That is to say, a, a lot of journalists really picked up a telephone and made a lot of phone calls and then quoted a lot of people. Uh, and that was in conjunction to a second trend, which is that their, their role went less from reporting facts because the facts could be reported much more quickly <coughs> on, talk ra on radio, on news radio, or on, uh, on television, to putting facts in a synthetic framework in telling a story. And, um, and so basically what happened is the, the role that the newspapers played in telling you something you didn't know factually got replaced by the TV. So you already knew about that speech, you'd seen that speech, or you heard about those facts, you've already heard them by the time you get the paper the next morning. Think of the election. The, the newspaper is the least useful tool for finding out what happened in the election because by the time they put the thing to bed at 10 o'clock, there's still results pouring in and you will go on to the internet to find out what the final results were on the election. So the actual reporting of facts got taken over by the electronic media and, it, and indeed if you go into a newspaper, uh, if you went into a news newsroom, what you would see is TVs and radios all over the place. So the reporting of facts was being done by the electronic media. So what happened is the newspapers took over the function that the Newsweeks and the Times did, which, uh, you know, Time Magazine, that is, they started to frame the facts into stories, which then led to the political people to say, well, if that's what they're doing, we're going to spin them, and we're going to tell them how to think about that story synthetically. So what I'm, I, what I'm getting at in answer to your story, uh, answer to your question, is that the role had already shifted for the print media. They weren't reporting the facts in a timely enough fashion to keep up with the electronic media. And, um, but nonetheless, if we lose those people that are trained to look at sources and are trained to, uh, to do things in an objective way, what we may get in, instead are people who are going to give you only those facts which fit the particular spin of the particular silo that they happen to be in. You know, and if you looked at his little chart, if you're in that silo, then you're going to give the facts. So, you know, if you watch Fox, you might not know that the war was going badly. You would never see the casualties. You didn't know what the expense was. And if you were on, uh, you know, on, on the, uh, the Democratic blogs, you might not see whether the bailout's working properly or not. In other words, you, you may not, you may get exclusion because of the screens. So that's what we have to worry about. And you have to hope that there's enough of an appetite for that, that some economic, sustainable economic model will support people who will make it their business to report the facts in a kind of professionally normed way. Yeah, I think that's very troubling. Yes. Yes. We're very We're worried, all, many of us, about yes. investigative reporting, and right. Right. it's going away. Right. That, yeah. Hello, uh, that is uh, the gist of my question, trying to think of where funding for in good investigative journalism should come from, or will come from. And I'm wondering if there may have to be a shift in what big foundations do, and there may have to be some foundations that take on the role of uh, a, uh, a synthesizer from, uh, from more politically oriented. Uh, 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 nonprofits, so that um, you're not supporting just your own view, but you're agreeing to a commons investigative journalism uh, support. Does anybody looking in that direction? I think there are people who are talking about the need for centers, at least, that do reporting in particular areas that might try to get endowments and then look a little like 
sort of universities, although their role is different. They're not teaching so much as they're trying to do the investigative reporting, trying to amass the facts, and to try to do reporting on that basis, and then making it available to people. Jeff, do you have? Or no, I, I appreciate no, but I, I think the economic model is the key. The problem right now is how do you capture, I mean, it, can you do it all off of endowments? That's awfully tough. It's going to be very tough. Um, yeah. And so one model is to somehow to get people to pay per article the way they, you download, uh, download uh, tunes, um, iTunes. That's possibly the case, although, I, I, again, we don't know whether that's going to work, whether would, people would be willing to do that uh, and how much they're willing to pay to do that. Uh, because with a tune... With a, with a song, you can listen to it over and over again and still get enjoyment. Um, probably even the best written newspaper article you would only read once. Maybe you'd read it twice, but you probably wouldn't get as much enjoyment the second or third time. So uh, I, we just don't know what model works, and, uh, and, in, and it's going to take some experimentation. This question is for Professor Nunberg and relates to what you were saying about the increased diffusion of vocabulary between the public and private registers. And specifically, I was wondering about uh, the migration of academic vocabulary into public discourse. Uh, often, the words get into public discourse but stripped of their original meanings. Uh, for example, the word deconstruct, which came from an academic source and now it's very common, but it doesn't seem to mean the same thing anymore. And I was wondering how much of you looked into this and do you think that this phenomenon is a bad phenomenon or does it have any social utility? No, I think it's an important phenomenon and another one of the themes that, particularly from the middle of the 20th century on, uh, become uh, central in, in the shifts in the English language. So if you look at the language that we ordinarily use in talking about the social sciences, sociology, yeah. sociology, psychology, and so forth, a, a huge amount of that language, peer group, status symbol, alienation, uh, 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 now they're not coming to me, but, but a, a, a juvenile delinquent. Uh, uh, I just did a piece on sociopath, a word that now just means somebody I don't like. I mean, you see it. <laughs> you see it applied of Obama's a sociopath, but even Dick Cheney's a sociopath. I say even Dick Cheney because when you look up the diagnostic criteria for sociopath, they usually begin with superficially charming. Right? <laughs> but, but so this this. This language um, has become uh, just part of the... Of the I, I identify with him. That's a, a, a term that people regarded as psychoanalytic jargon in the 1950s. So it's become part of, 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 our, of our language. And, and one more example I think is particularly important. Values, in the sense in which it's used in, in, in politics, uh, was introduced in the 1880s, 1890s, via German sociologist into English. Until the 1950s or so, it was an obscure word, uh, kind of a pretentious Upper West Side liberal word uh, that you'd see in a Jules Pfeiffer cartoon or McNichols and May routine. Um, it wasn't until the late 60s that the Republicans adopted it and made it a, a kind of mantra for uh, the culture wars. But it, it's another word that com follows this path. So yeah, a, a huge part of the, uh, the, our most interesting vocabulary comes from those sources. Hi. Um, I was just thinking about the graphic that I'm sorry, I don't know your names very well. Um, the graphic about the two political discourses on the blogosphere, like the liberals and the conservatives, and that from, I found that really fascinating, mostly because I think about all the times I avoid conservative blogs. Um, and then I thought about uh, like my own like grandparents and how my grandfather would only read, you know, the Wall Street Journal and the GE Quarterly like Quarterly Journal, and like then he would go and like talk to his friends about like finances. And we live in Greenwich, Connecticut, so. Like that's kind of to me seemed like his own little political universe. So I don't know. Is do you think that this like idea of like there having being two political discourses in the blogs is that a new phenomenon? And do you think that it will um, change? Like, do you expect to see more yellow links in the future? Well, Greenwich is. I, I, both both the other speakers have more to say about this now. But I think Greenwich is is an interesting case, and I think you could look at this as the Greenwichization of America, uh, in, in in one sense or uh, in one sense. There are many more communities like Greenwich. Uh, there are more office and workplaces like Greenwich, and there are more sites on the internet like Greenwich. But One of the things political yeah. scientists yeah. are worried about is if you look at 
a geographical dispersion of the political parties, it looks like there's more and more aggregation of each party in particular locales. And so there's more and more polarization geographically across the two parties, and therefore people don't talk to one another who are of a different party. Now the one place where there seems to be a fair amount of interchange across parties is the workplace. But of course, if you have this geographic concentration of the parties, workplaces then will increasingly become of one tonality. Uh, certainly here at Berkeley, it's hard to get a lot of conservative viewpoints, and when anybody complains about that, I always say, well, thank goodness for John Yu. <laughs> well, let, let me just say, let me I thought just, you'd like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I think that in this context, there's something comforting about the data that uh, Henry showed at the beginning and Jeffrey alluded to, which is most people are apathetic. And that's comforting because it means that there's uh, there's an enormous amount of buffer in the society. Most people are not as agitated as you are about liberal causes, and most people are not as agitated as uh, you know, Rush Limbaugh is about Republican or conservative causes. So the polarization that we're seeing in America, and it's been alluded to several times, is largely concentrated at an elite level, so to speak, or a small level. And it doesn't seem to be permeating down into, uh, there, there's no evidence at the individual level that polarization is increased. What it seems to be is a, is a sorting phenomena and a siloing phenomena with respect to the blogs. But as yet, it's not reaching down. And I think the apathy in some sense or the distraction with other pursuits ends up being a good thing in the United States. Uh, your last comment almost uh, uh, seems to me to indicate that uh, talk radio or Limbaugh uh, is maybe more popular than influential. Uh, do you believe talk radio is influential on the political, in the political spectrum? Uh, if we mean by influential that sometimes it leads to uh, coordinated political action, yes. Uh, I suspect the Tea Party is an example of that, the, the Tea Parties. Or uh, if you look at what happened at the tail end of the Democratic presidential primary, there's some evidence that Limbaugh's attempt to organize his followers to vote for Hillary Clinton uh, to stop Obama may have shifted a couple percentage points of the vote in uh, a couple of the southern primaries. But that's a pretty small drop in the political bucket. And uh, it's not obvious to me that talk radio has been a huge force. And similarly, the blogosphere on the Democratic side Think of their failure to take out Lieberman in Connecticut. Even though they were furious with him and they concentrated all their efforts and they said, you know, we've got this new power and we're going to take out Lieberman and it didn't work. So uh, there's a bit of an oversell going on in terms of these forces as political forces. I, I, just to, to add one thing, sure. I, I, I do think that talk radio has been particularly influential with regard to another shift that, that to a linguist uh, is... is, is perhaps more salient than it is to political scientists to do so, so, as, as, as survey work. And that's the, 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 the reconfiguration of political identities along cultural lines, uh, so that liberals and conservatives become identified more by their habits of consumption, their personality types, their, uh, uh, the stereotypes associated with them, than by their policy positions. And I think talk radio has done a lot um, to, to establish those, uh, th those distinctions, and, and, and so has Fox and... and uh, and uh, broadcast cable, I think. Okay, okay I, wanna, I wanna thank everyone. We have used up our allotted time, and uh, I wanna thank uh, Professor Brady, Professor Kane, Professor Nunberg, and I also wanna thank everyone here for attending. Thank you.